Hello, and welcome to Postvention and Beyond, how to address short and long-term impacts of suicide in healthcare. I'm Sarah Prom, the Senior Director of Clinical Services for Vital Work Life, and I'll be the moderator for this panel discussion. I'm very grateful to be in the company of our panelists today, as they bring wisdom and compassion to the complexity that comes with the loss by suicide. I also want to recognize that you, as participants in the audience, are here for a variety of reasons and with different experiences, and the panelists and I want to honor the difficulty of this topic. We want to start our time together with a question for all of you, um, and while you share your responses, I'll give a brief introduction to our panelists and then pose the first question. Maggie Mortali is one of our panelists. She's the Vice President of Programs and Workplace Initiatives at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Dr. Jar George Regolius is the Chief Clinical Officer for R3 Continuum, a workplace behavioral health pioneer and innovator, providing rapid response in the wake of disruption and stress. Dr. Catherine Godfrey is a licensed clinical psychologist and the director for the Center of Work-Life Wellbeing at Christiana Care in Delaware. And Betsy Gall is author, suicide activist, and speaker all over the country about physician suicide after her oncologist husband, Dr. Matthew Gall, tragically and unexpectedly took his own life on Thanksgiving Day in 2019. Uh, we want to start out our time together um, really kind of digging in both to the results and learning more about our panelists. So as we close our poll and take a minute to reflect on the results that are there, um, I'm gonna ask Maggie if she could start for us by sharing a bit more about her unique connection with this topic, uh, and then also your reaction uh, to the polling numbers and how those numbers coincide with what you know the statistics and prevalence of suicide to be. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to Vital Work Life for hosting today's webinar, to the fellow panelists for being here today, and um, and, and to the participants for um, joining us here in this really important conversation. As um, Sarah mentioned, I'm Maggie Mortali. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Workplace Initiatives for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And in my role, I work with organizations and institutions across the country to really help them to build out um, unique and comprehensive suicide prevention and postvention efforts to support their, their workforce. So um, I think, you know, with, with the polls going on today and, and the results coming in, I think the first thing I just want to say is that, um, you know, I'm seeing 63% of you have shared that you've experienced a loss due to suicide. I myself am a suicide loss survivor. And so just the first thing that I want to say here is that, that, is that you are not alone. Um, you're not alone in this loss and in your experience. And um, we know that suicide has such a wide reaching impact on, on many different levels, on individuals and their families, on communities and even society as a whole. I can share that the research has shown that a single suicide loss impacts on average 130 to 135 different people. And, um, and, is, and, and really can be such a sensitive topic to discuss um, the the experience for any one loss survivor is 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 unique, and so when when we're here today and here in community today, one of the first things I just want to share is um, is that that how we talk about suicide matters. Talking about suicide and suicide loss matters. It's critical to to their prevention, and so I'll start off by just sharing a few kind of key terms and phrases that you may hear throughout today's webinar and, and as you go on about having conversations about suicide and um, suicide loss. And one of them um, is probably the most common term you'll hear when we talk about suicide and it's the, the phrase committed suicide. And um, as that is, is, is really part of the, the common vernacular when talking about suicide, it's really recommended that we refrain from using that, that terminology or that phrasing of committed suicide as it can often have a, a judgmental connotation with it. It can be um, attributed to that of committing a crime. Um, and, and suicide, more importantly, is really a health issue. And so talking about suicide in the way that we'll be talking about suicide today 
is really in the context of a public health issue. And so just like we talk about other health issues like cancer or, or cardiac arrest, you know, we wouldn't say someone committed cancer, right? Or they committed a heart attack we would say that they died from cancer, they died of a heart attack. And so the same really goes for suicide. And so we really encourage using the phrases died by suicide or death by suicide. And so those are just some of the common terms and, and phrases that you'll hear throughout this presentation and that really build upon suicide prevention um, and talking about suicide safely and effectively. And so it's really our hope that, um, that this webinar today will help to foster those life-saving conversations. So thank you. Thanks, Maggie. I'm George Vergolius. Um, I want to echo what Maggie opened with. Uh, just thank you for all participating today, and thank you to Vital Work Life for putting on this uh, discussion, which is so important right now. Um, my background, very quickly, um, Chief Clinical Officer for R3 Continuum. We work a lot with disruptive events, traumatic events that hit the workplace. It could be uh, a suicide um, that occurs um, related to somebody at the workplace, an accidental death, a natural disaster, a man-made event such as a robbery or a mass shooting. Um, and we respond to roughly 1,400 to 1,600 events every month. So we, we deal a lot with trauma-informed response. And with that, we deal a lot with people that feel like they can't go on and they're having suicidal thoughts. Um, in addition to that, I also, have, for 20 years, have a practice in the greater um, North Carolina, the Raleigh region of North Carolina, um, working in emergency departments. And we primarily are dealing with issues of imminent risk. So people that have thoughts of harming themselves or others. So that's kind of my background that brings kind of some informed uh, doctoral, forensic, clinical background to it. Um, I love what Maggie said. And what's interesting about the language is language is important because what's interesting about the poll um, one third of you, um, or us, because we all participated, um, basically said that we've not been affected, but two thirds have. And I would venture to guess, based on my experience, that if we were to ask how many of us are comfortable having discussions about suicide, two, -thir two thirds of us would not say yes. So two thirds of us have directly experienced this as a survivor, but far less, I would venture to say, are comfortable having discussions. And with that, I think the words that we use and how we describe this in a way that doesn't stigmatize or, or put somebody into a victim role, but really opens the dialogue that this is a health condition, a health reality, like many others, and it really requires care and kind of a supportive response. So that's the one thing I want to open with is just to echo that um, from Maggie. Some people might say it's just semantics. It's not just semantics when you're sitting in front of somebody that you're really worried is moving on a trajectory of suicidal thinking and you need to engage with them and you really want them to open, um, particularly if they're closed off to begin with on a topic that lends itself to a lot of guardedness. So again, thank you, Maggie, for bringing that up. Um, the other thing I think I will, I'll highlight and then I'll kick it over to um, Katie is, you know, it's really interesting. We've seen a lot of impact of mental um, health issues and stress coming off of the pandemic, right? We've seen probably, I think it's about a 3x increase in depression, a 4x increase in anxiety. There has been an uptick in not only suicidal thinking um, and, and ideation expressed um, in, in polls, but also um, attempts. Um, what's interesting is when you look at us historically, especially in the USA, we are probably more informed about self-care and psychological principles and the openness of therapy than we've ever been in our, in our history. Um, we're more psychologically minded, you might say. And yet we still are seeing record elevations in disorders of despair, substance abuse and addiction, depression, anxiety, and isolation loneliness. And what's part of the thing for me, I think, is we have to learn how do we have difficult discussions with people? How do we broker difficult discussions that are not easy for us and certainly not easy for the person that might be going through a crisis? Um, and, and I'm not gonna unpack all of that now. We could probably unpack that as we move forward today. And I'm sure the panelists have some other thoughts on that. But that's one thing I would wanna open with is we need to start thinking about how can we have these type of discussions and, and create environments in which people feel safe to come forward and say, you know, I'm having some dark thoughts and I want to talk to somebody about that. 
Um, so I'll kind of stop there um, and pass it on to see what uh, um, Dr. Godfrey wants to add. Thank you so much, George. Uh, so I'm Katie Godfrey. I'm the director of the Center for Work-Life Wellbeing at Christiana Care in Delaware. And I work in a center dedicated to supporting the well-being of healthcare professionals. I've worked clinically as a psychologist in a range of outpatient and residential settings, um, including supporting clients who have had suicidal thoughts and behaviors. In my current role, I do a lot of work to uh, develop a prevention and post-prevention programs within my organization, as well as developing organizational policies and doing well-being and mental health advocacy uh, at local levels and beyond. So a little bit about my background and how I have come to this work. Um, and I appreciate everyone responding on the poll. And I just want to say for uh, the majority of us who have been affected uh, by suicide, whether it's the loss of a colleague, a friend, a family member, a loved one, a neighbor, um, I'm so sorry for your losses, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here to be part of this important conversation. And as important as it is to discuss suicide and shine a light on this often very stigmatized and taboo issue, it's also very emotionally difficult to talk about, especially if you have a personal experience with loss. So please be gentle with yourselves as you go through this webinar um, and as we talk about this issue that's so important and also so challenging to talk about. Um, you know, one thing that strikes me about just the results of the poll is, uh, you know, how many folks have responded that they were affected um, by, by suicide loss. And I think that's something that is certainly shifting within our society. You know, it used to be that, um, you know, I work in the world of healthcare professionals, so I'll, I'll talk about that world specifically, but it used to be that the death of healthcare professionals by suicide mostly went unreported. Um, so before the 1970s, if a physician, for example, died by suicide, the cause of death might have been concealed, maybe by a physician colleague or by the medical examiner, and perhaps even the family wouldn't know that that's the way that a physician or, you know, another healthcare professional uh, had died. It was just considered way too taboo and almost unheard of to discuss the fact that uh, people die by suicide, and certainly that healthcare professionals have uh, the capacity to die by suicide. And so, I think the fact that we're gathered here today with attendees that can openly share that they know someone who's died by suicide, I think that represents real progress in kind of being more open and raising awareness of the fact that this is a really important mental health issue and that uh, suicide is possible and it affects so many people. So I think the more we can talk openly about it, uh, it really goes a long way to reducing the stigma and reducing the barriers to help seeking um, and improving uh, prevention efforts for those who are struggling with suicidal thoughts, as well as those who have experienced loss from suicide and, and the support that we can provide to all of you. Um, I will kick it over to, to Betsy, who's gonna share with us uh, from her experience. Um, I too just wanna say thank you to everybody that's on this panel and a special shout out to Sarah and Mitch at Vital Work Life. The, the work that they're doing is amazing and it is needed. I am not an expert on suicide. I unfortunately was <clears throat> married to a great man, an awesome doctor, Dr. Matthew Taylor Gall, who was an oncologist for 16 years, who died by suicide. Um, so to answer the polling question, I have to be honest with you, before my husband took his own life, I did not know one person that died by suicide. I had not been affected by it whatsoever. I didn't even have a friend of a friend. Um, <clears throat> the past three years and 10 months, I've had a crash course in, um, in the subject of suicide and it is, it is dark and terrifying and very sad. And so I'm very grateful to the work that all of you have committed to doing um, to shed some light on this dark subject so that we can eradicate it um, and the stigma and start making serious change, especially for our healthcare professionals. Um, I think Sarah mentioned that since the last time I was here two years ago, um, just about two years ago in September, I, um, I wrote a book about my journey and what happened um, to Matthew. And I have now, um, I guess, become an advocate, but I, I will tell you, I get um, people reaching out from all over the world. This is not, uh, 
a subject that is just here in America. I have physician spouses that have reached out um, from Australia and India and countless other places. I mean, Delaware, I had um, a spouse reach out to me. Her husband died by suicide just a month ago. So it's a very serious topic and um, I'm, I'm glad that we're shedding light on it. So thank you all. Thanks so much to all of you for those those reflections really on the poll. I think that the the bravery of people in the audience to share that, but then also to hear, you know, the varied kind of backgrounds and angles that you're coming from today for the discussion is just going to make it um, hopefully a, a robust share, but also something that really um, impacts, you know, that that large group of, of people that have been um, have been impacted by suicide in some way. Um, we do have another poll for you, and the reason for that, we kind of have um, have highlighted that in just the opening, um, is that the hope here is that we can enhance our abilities to navigate the difficult days and weeks and months and years truly after the, there's been a loss by suicide. Um, so the next question that we have for you um, hopefully does a couple of things. One, I think will help to normalize the struggle that comes for all of us with not knowing what to say or do, um, and also open the door for us to share with one another the best ways, the most helpful ways um, to approach these, um, these very challenging situations. Um, I find that as a therapist myself, I often get asked this question or, or a question about what do I say Right? What do, I don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Um, and people are usually operating off of these myths that come around saying the right or wrong thing. And I think it's helpful, and I, I share this with others, um, to think about it as um, talking about suicide does not cause people to kill themselves, but not talking about suicide might. And so thinking about how we take that step, how we reach out, how we connect, and some of the best ways to do that, I think can um, can help us all to decrease that stigma and open up the doors for these kinds of conversations. As the answers continue to roll in, an overwhelming number of you have been in that, that position, right? Not knowing what to say or what to do or what the best thing is to do in these situations. Um, and I wanna ask our panelists to reflect again on the poll, um, but also from your own unique perspective, share what you would recommend in these painful situations, both from an individual perspective, but also from an organizational perspective. Um, how can, can the support be given to those who have lost a friend or a loved one or a colleague uh, to suicide? And I'm gonna ask Betsy to, to start us off. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I will say that not saying anything is probably the worst. I found out what the term silence is deafening really meant firsthand and it's painful. So I would highly recommend that if you are approaching somebody that has been affected by suicide, even just saying, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to say is better than saying nothing at all. Um, there is a lot of shame and guilt surrounding suicide. It is a very complex way to die for those of us left behind. Um, and so to have people not even acknowledge you, it happened to me at the grocery store when um, a, a woman that I knew lived in my neighborhood, her husband worked with my husband and literally looked at me and looked the other way. And your heart just sinks because there are, you're already grieving um, and you're already in so much pain, but to not have this person come up and just give me a hug and say, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to say, it was just so much worse. So uh, I'll leave it up to the professionals, but just from a, a personal um, aspect, that, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Betsy, for sharing your personal experience. Um, I think oftentimes, when folks are not supportive or they don't know what to say, they just kind of avoid saying anything at all, right? Or avoid that conversation or avoid that person in the grocery store. And I'm so sorry you had that painful experience. Um, I think there are some comments coming in in the chat as well that um, are some common things to avoid, right? Saying things like everything happens for a reason or they're in a better place that may not reflect the experience of the person who is grieving. Um, you know, it's 
just more important to be with the person you're supporting and their feelings, just like Betsy said, even if you don't know what to say and to, to express that. I'm not sure that there's anything I could say to make you feel better and make this pain go away, but I'm here for you um, and not really needing to, to cheer them up or make them feel better. Um, you know, it's a kind of grief that I think a lot of folks have trouble reckoning with if you don't have experience with it or you don't, um, you haven't had the opportunity to talk openly about it. And so uh, it can be really uncomfortable for folks uh, approaching kind of that from that position of wanting to provide support. Um, I think what we can do when we're supporting folks who are experiencing loss due to suicide is just recognizing that everyone responds differently and grieves differently and kind of honoring the feelings that might show up for them and holding them with great compassion. So sometimes folks could be in a lot of shock or disbelief. They could have a lot of confusion or sadness. They could feel even frustration or anger. Um, certainly the, the feelings of shame and guilt, blame and other painful emotions arise. And there's no one way to respond to a death by suicide or to feel after a death by suicide. And so I think being able to honor those experiences and name them and support them compassionately, um, as well as connecting with support resources can be really helpful. Knowing that you're not alone, um, you know, when, when maybe there's someone at the grocery store who doesn't know how to support you, to be able to connect with someone in a support group who, who can support you, who can be there for you, I think can be really powerful to support individuals who have experienced loss due to suicide. And I think organizations can do a lot. You can, um, you know, connect with leadership or with HR to come up with a support plan for colleagues. Um, I think it's helpful to do, you know, proactive outreach, make sure people know about available resources, um, you know, know that they're not alone and don't have to process this alone. Um, in our organization, we do a lot of group support that we co-facilitate with our amazing chaplain colleagues um, to give an opportunity to, to check in with how folks are doing and process their feelings, support one another, um, and talk about support resources. So that, you know, that's one way that as an organization we respond um, to try and make sure that we're proactive and connecting with teams um, and individuals, leaders who have been affected by suicide loss in the workplace. George, would you like to share from your experience? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> although I feel ill-equipped now that Betsy and Katie covered so many key points. Um, and I'll say, you know, Betsy, when you strip away all the psychobabble, what you said really is spot on. It really is. Um, so I, the only thing I think I could add beyond what already has been so well articulated, um, and what's interesting is I had experience about 12 years ago, a good friend of mine um, died by suicide. I actually ran into another friend, mutual friend of ours. Um, I was a bit closer to this friend that died um, in a store. It was a hardware store. And they did the same thing. They made eye contact that Betsy described and they kind of walked away, like avoided me. What was interesting is I bumped into this person, this man in another aisle and we were crossing each other and, and he stopped and something he did that was really profound. And I was fairly seasoned already as a psychologist. Um, and this really rocked me in a positive way. He said, you know, George, I avoided you. And you know, I avoided you because I'll be honest, I have no idea what to say to you. And I still don't know what to say to you. But I want you to know that I'm caring about you. And that was just so healing. And I and, and I acknowledged it. And I was like, I get it. I don't know what to say back to you, <laughs> right? Like no one expected, we'll call him Steve. That wasn't his real name. No one expected that Steve was that upset or that depressed um, and so on and so forth. But it was just, I guess my point is there was an authentic open dialogue where it wasn't, we need to fix it. And one of the difficulties I find is when you're on that survivor side of the equation or you're on the other side, right? Where you're not sure what to say, there is a tendency. And by the way, men in particular, we want to solve things, right? So we're really bad at this, of trying to solve it. And sometimes you don't need to solve it. You just need to be supportive. You just need to be an ear to listen. Um, so that's the one thing, authentic, open dialogue. And as Betsy said, it's okay not to know what to say. I would urge us not to do the complete avoidance, right? Um, the other difficulty with that avoidance tactic, even if you're in a dialogue, is there is a weird flip that happens. When I was a survivor of my friend dying by suicide, 
I found 50% of my conversations, I felt like I had to be the caretaker because the other person was feeling so awkward. So here I am going through this grief. They're super awkward in front of me. And now I'm worried about their emotional state. And I'm in this weird flip of like, wait, you should be there for me, but I'm actually more worried about you because, and it creates this really strange, you know, um, dynamic. And again, as Katie said, because people do experience grief and loss differently. Um, so I'm a fan of just, again, authentic, open dialogue, reiterate what Betsy said. If you don't know what to say, at least acknowledge that and just leave it there for a bit. And then if you have to get back to it later, that's okay too. At least you're not um, ostracizing or isolating someone in an emotional bubble. Um, not that that would be anyone's um, you know, intention. Um, the other thing I would say as a, um, as a person talking to a survivor, like how do you broach that topic? Um, think about the difference that we arbitrarily give when we talk about mental health and physical health. And I'm not going to do this, but if we took a quick poll and I said, I'm writing a paper on physical health, what do you think I would talk about? Most of you would say nutrition, cardiovascular exercise, yoga, working out, eating well, sleep hygiene, right? And if I ask, well, tell me I'm writing, a, you know, I'm writing an article or a book on mental health. What do you think I'm going to talk about? Most of you would say depression, anxiety, substance abuse, except we all have mental health, just like we all have physical health. And to good or bad degrees, we take care of it or we maintain it. And sometimes even if we maintain it, ideally, mental health or mental illness, rather, or physical illness still impact us. So I actually use that dichotomy sometimes when I'm talking to people and it destigmatize. It helps a little bit to destigmatize, right? Because what it realized, it goes back to what Maggie said at the beginning, that people that have a series of stressors, whether it's depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, that lead to suicidal thinking, and then eventually may lead to someone dying by suicide, um, they are dealing with a difficulty like a physical illness in terms of they're dealing with a problem. And it isn't about their ego. It isn't about pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. And so when I'm talking with someone that's in a survivor mode, sometimes I use that as an intro and I find it, it, it kind of destigmatizes the entire situation. Because the other thing I've seen, and I felt this, and what's funny is I was a 10 year seasoned psychologist by then and I still felt this. I felt some ownership of my friend's death. I should have seen it when I was a good friend. Two, I'm a psychologist. I really should have seen it. And so there was some weird stigma, even in my own mind, of, wow, what did I miss? You know, and I was at fault here as well as my friend for, you know, and then the guilt that comes with that. So um, the last thing I will say is well-being, when you think of well-being, it doesn't equal comfort. Now, there are times that if you live a good life of well-being, hopefully you're feeling comfortable in your skin and your life more often than not. But well-being does not mean we're always comfortable. And so that's another thing, this sense of I'm worried about the survivor's well-being, so I don't want to have a discomforting conversation. It's okay. They're already going through a really difficult time. And frankly, what I find with people dealing with grief related to loss from suicide, if they don't want to have the conversation, they're going to tell you. They're going to level set. Um, so just a few different things to think about as you navigate through that. I hope I didn't steal all the ideas that uh, Betsy and Katie already brought to the table, Maggie. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Sure. No, I mean, thank you to everyone who shared. I think um, there's a lot of sort of commonalities, right, in the lost survivor experience and, and also in the grief experience. Um, I think every individual has their own really unique loss and healing journey. Um, and and each suicide loss is is quite unique, right? There's there's a complexity to suicide that I think um, uh, you know everyone here is talking about, and and I think with that, many loss survivors are sort of left with these open ended questions, right? Why? What did I miss? Right? As you mentioned, George and and others, um, and it's our human sort of instinct to answer those those questions right we want to we want to answer them we want to fix the issue right or 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 have a solution be these solution oriented folks that are going to come in and 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 help our our fr friend our family member our loved one um who's going through this loss and um and i and and truly 
what what they need is is to just have our presence and have us be there and be patient and be non-judgmental listeners and and sit and be with them in that discomfort. Um, I love what everyone's sharing about saying, you know, I don't know what to say, right? I don't know what to do. That is so much more authentic and 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 powerful um, than than ignoring someone right in the supermarket or in the hardware store. And um and that is being in the discomfort because as loss survivors, we often think, I don't know what to say either, right? I'm at a loss for words. I'm trying to answer questions that I never thought I'd have to ask. And so to be able to extend that and say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you is so incredibly powerful. And I think with that too, for folks that may themselves not be lost survivors, right? Um, one of the things we do in grief is to, to, to show compassion through empathy and understanding, right? And so oftentimes we wanna say things like, I understand what you're going through. But I'll say that if you're not a lost survivor, um, that's not something you need to say because the complexity of suicide and the, and the suicide loss often leave survivors feeling like you cannot truly understand my loss and what I'm going through. And that's okay. It's okay to, to, to not understand what they're going through. It's okay to simply just acknowledge again, I, I'm here for you. I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. And, um, and, and just again, be in, in that space with them, be a safe space for the person to um to have and experience the complexities of the grief that that so often um is mixed in with suicide loss um oftentimes when someone when someone dies we feel a deep sense of of sadness um but with suicide loss we know that there can sometimes be relief in that sadness especially if the person was really struggling with a, a complex mental health condition or chronic um, mental health condition or, or pain for a long period of time. And with that comes guilt, right? Guilt over feeling that sense of, of relief. Um, there's also can be anger and then guilt for feeling angry, right? And, and so just being in a space with a loss survivor, letting them just give voice to their anger, to feeling frustrated, to expressing fear, relief, sadness, all of the, the, the sort of multitudes of feelings that we can all experience at any one time is incredibly powerful. And to, to do that, you don't need to say anything other than I'm here for you. And just being with them and reassuring them in that presence, in community with them, that you're someone who cares and you can offer them a place of solace. And I think lastly, what I'll just say is that the trajectory of grief and loss and healing journey is different for everyone. And that it's really um, up to you know friends and families of that loss survivor, individuals, to really be patient and to be available for folks in their loss. Remember that the, the weeks and months following the loss is can be a time when, when maybe you think the initial shock wears off, but it can often be the time when it sinks in, right? And that reality sinks in of what happened and that time period can often be even more tough for the loss survivor right, in the um, sort of months and years after. And so it's really important to make sure that you're continuing to check in with them, letting them know that you're thinking of them, that you're there for them, and really creating that space for them without a timeline for them to continue on in their loss and healing journey and knowing that you're with them and you're patient throughout that process. Thank you, Maggie, and, and the rest of the panelists. I think one of the biggest takeaways 
um, from your sharing is this idea of transparency, right? Whether that's just being transparent about saying, I don't know what to say. I want to say something. I don't know what that is. And you probably don't know what to say either. I wrote that down because I felt like that was one of those moments where you join with them in their, their vulnerable place and you just make it okay to be together. Um, and also keeping in mind that that the length of time needed is so different for everyone. So um, I know that I've heard, you know, people share their experience that there's a lot of outpouring of support very close to the, um, you know, the event occurring. And then it kind of, you know, wanes, right? And we have to remember that this is a, a journey that we have to recognize and be mindful of in our personal you know relationships but also in the workplace if if there are colleagues that are, are experiencing this being mindful that checking in and and saying those same things a month six months eight months later is still needed so putting that kind of mindset on uh, when we're thinking about some of those things that we can do uh, can bring about that support in ways that that they weren't expecting but that they likely still need so we want to be able to share lessons learned with the participants today. So um, I want to start again uh, with you, Maggie, to share again for each of you from your unique perspectives, um, whether it be you know, personal to organizational or workplace, um, can you identify what you would say are some uh, best practices to navigate the long-term impacts um, of loss due to suicide? Uh, which we know can include things. I think, um, Katie, you said, you know, prevention efforts. Um, it can include um, culture change initiatives, resources, education, uh, all those different types of things. So from each of you, if you could share with us what you would identify that our participants today can really take and, and put into planning and action. So we'll start with Maggie on this one. Sure, and I'll um, sort of take a broad brush approach here and then let my colleagues share to you more specifically um, some of the different, you know, again, programs and resources um, that are available and, and some of the work that they're doing. You know, I think um, in, in talking about um, suicide loss, you know, the understanding or coming from a place of understanding, um, even when we say that, um, you know, we don't know what to say or what to do, knowing that there are, you um, prevention programs and efforts out there, um, we often see in the aftermath of a suicide loss, um, some of the organizations and, and, and workplace perspectives that that will often prompt the need for suicide prevention efforts. And um, while we know that suicide prevention is a, as a workplace and an organizational, you know, health and safety priority, providing time for postvention response, providing time for healing um, to begin before introducing new suicide prevention efforts is really, really recommended. Um, in the immediate aftermath of a, a suicide, let's say of an employee or colleague, postvention strategies should really be focused on certainly crisis response, which I know George can speak to, but but also really about um, you know, focusing on the workplace and the community in their grief, helping folks feel supported, and then really managing those key steps of crisis response and communication. Um, it's really, really critical to give time before any suicide prevention efforts um, are brought about, because we know from postvention efforts that if postvention, um, the response, the immediate aftermath to a suicide loss is done safely and effectively, that intrinsically has uh, prevention as part of it. Um, by talking about the suicide loss, um, by sharing mental health and suicide prevention resources during that time, those can all be life-saving efforts. Um, but again, really making it, uh, providing that in a space, in a way for organizations and their employees to really start that loss and healing journey is absolutely critical to long-term postvention strategies, but also prevention as well. So we'll start there and then I will turn it over to George. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. That's great. Um, and it, it, there's a number of resources. And I think, um, Sarah, if I remember correctly, you're going to list some later or in a few minutes. Um, you know what's interesting? So I'm, I'm 54 and 
as I've evolved as a psychologist, right? Sometimes I call myself a recovering psychologist and I don't mean addiction wise. I mean, recovering from some of the psychological theories, right? That, that I was ingrained on early career. I've become deeply um, impressed by peer support after, um, after someone um, dies by suicide and the survivors are trying to uh, cope with that. Um, you know, there's an old there's an old saying: the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Right? There's a lot of formal services out there that have knowledge, all the technical knowledge about you know grief and treatment, and 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 sometimes people need survivors need treatment. Right? They may for a number of reasons. Don't underestimate the immense natural resources, be it faith based groups be it other uh, groups in the community, be it survivor groups, uh, other types of self-help groups, where people have a shared lived experience, that is so immensely powerful. There have been times that I've actually done therapy with individuals and I've gotten them to the point where I've literally said, I've taken you as far as I can. I think you need to go and connect with people that have dealt with this directly and you need to learn from their wisdom. Um, and, and so... So I, I try to have a balance between there's times where formal clinical resources might be needed, but don't underestimate the, the power of these other resources in our life, be it faith-based groups or those support groups where people have navigated through this and continue to, like, like Betsy. Um, so the, I think that's really, really important. The other thing I would highlight, and this is still pretty high level, um, in those earlier phases, it could be days, weeks, or months, you know, we've all heard the term hope floats. And it's important to help instill hope and support. Um, I have a saying that hope floats, but it doesn't swim. So hope gets us to the surface. It gives us some motivation to rise, but then we need to kind of get into some movement to try to reshape, redefine our life as we move forward without this dear person in it on the daily basis that they once were. And so I'm also a fan of as we navigate through that, helping people get engaged, whether it's they want to get engaged with initiatives that educate um, um, or support others, or whether it's something is, is, is direct as I want to get healthy again, physically. And, but whatever it is, physical activity in combination with those other supports, I find is really, really important to avoid that kind of depressive lull that grief can always in the vegetative symptoms, what we call the physical symptoms of not wanting to sleep or not getting out of bed or not feeling energetic. Um, that could be really powerful as well as people are navigating through those other, those other areas. Organizationally, one comment that we've seen again and again, when we respond to suicide issues in the workplace and, 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 um, after a successful or, or when, when one dies by suicide, what we tend to see is a variation of two things. One is, let's say it's me, you know, a, a loved one of mine dies by suicide and I take a week or two off. When I come back to the workplace, no one knows how to treat me, just like Betsy's experience in the grocery store. My manager doesn't know what to say. No one else knows what to say. Do I talk to George about it? Do I pretend it doesn't exist? So educating management teams, educating coworkers, while also respecting confidentiality, that's delicate. Um, often what we'll recommend is talk to the person that's taking leave and ask them, can we have a few conversations, can we have a conversation about your reentry plan? What do you want people to know? What don't you want them to know? Do you want us to talk about, at least at a high level, understanding um, some of the complexities, as Maggie and Katie have talked about, related to the feelings of being a survivor? Um, and then we honor the wishes of that survivor. If they say, nope, I don't want anyone knowing anything, we'll honor that. But you still can educate people generically on what it's like to deal with loss when people are coming back into the workplace. The other variation that we've seen, and I believe one individual, and I appreciate the openness disclosed in the chat, when somebody attempts suicide, fortunately doesn't die, and then they come back to work as the person that tried, and now that has leaked, or that's, a, you know, maybe it's a small town, maybe it's a small manufacturing plant. Everybody knows everybody. They go to the same church. They play on the same little league team, right? It's a small community. And everyone knows that George tried to do something to himself. 
So organizations really need to think about that and, and how do we soften um, that re-entry in a way that works for the survivor, but also works for the other people. There's no direct answer beyond think about that, have awareness, and and, and try to talk ahead of time about kind of a, a re-entry, what we call a re-entry plan. So that's for at the organization level. I know that Katie and Betsy still need a way in, so I'm going to pass it on to Katie. Thank you so much, George. Um, so I, I think some of the attendees at the webinar might be interested in um, a resource from the American Hospital Association that came out uh, somewhat recently around evidence-enhanced interventions, and they uh, to specifically to support uh, suicide in healthcare professionals. And they identified kind of three drivers of suicide or factors that contribute to suicide in healthcare professionals. And so I think when considering prevention efforts and organizational responses, I think considering kind of these three factors can be really helpful to kind of organize efforts. So I'll share what the, the three factors are and then um, talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done within our organization. Um, so the first driver is uh, inadequate access to behavioral health education and treatment resources. So making sure that uh, caregivers and, and uh, clinicians that folks who are employed um, and their family members are aware of uh, the mental health resources within an organization, whether it's the employee assistance program or other resources that they may have. Um, it's kind of impossible to over communicate and over promote these resources. I, I find just making sure that people are aware of them uh, is really, really important. And we have lots of different methods that we use to do that um, proactively and in response to um, events and situations. Um, we've launched a psychological first aid training program that has trained now over 600 leaders within our organization to equip leaders and managers with the skills to have conversations, uh, to check in with folks when it looks like they're shifting in terms of their level of stress, and to have conversations about well-being before it's a crisis with the idea that we want to normalize checking in with someone when they don't seem quite like themselves, when it seems like they could benefit from a check-in, when we want to make sure that leaders know about resources that are available and what they could use. Um, and so, you know, that that's one way that we've tried to make it really easy for um, our clinicians, our caregivers, our physicians and nurses, everyone who works here at Christiana Care to be aware of the behavioral health resources and to also normalize conversations about mental health and well-being. Um, another kind of component which is related to psychological first aid is the stigma of talking about behavioral health and seeking behavioral health treatment. So certainly for folks who work in healthcare, that can often be, you know, a stigma and a real concern about kind of being in that patient role and sometimes even questions about what, what will happen if I seek treatment or have a diagnosis. Will I uh, lose my license or will I not be able to be credentialed anymore? And so I think there can be real fears about what might happen if folks seek services. And I think demystifying the process of what is it like to seek services or what are the licensure laws or credentialing questions within my organization, within my state? Um, because I think a lot of times the fear and anxiety and concerns are kind of stronger than really what the language is in practice. And I know there's a lot of work happening across, the organiza across our organization and, and with many other organizations and across the nation to change a lot of the licensing, licensing and credentialing questions. Um, to make sure that they're reducing the stigma around help seeking and making sure that um, folks aren't being um, kind of penalized or judged based on having a diagnosis or having sought past treatment for any kind of mental health condition. So that, that's a huge component as well. Um, in addition to doing what we can to reduce job-related stressors. Um, and I'll just say one more component about that is that we do have a, a peer support program um, called Care for the Caregiver that has been around for many years now. And we um, provide confidential peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, we have about 500 encounters per year. So to George's point, I think that power of peer support, being able to know that you can connect with another physician or another nurse, another respiratory therapist, someone else who knows what it's like to work in healthcare, but isn't necessarily in your primary area, um, but can also provide you with that confidential support and someone who's trained, someone who's trained, right, to know what to say and uh, what not to say so that they can really be there to listen non-judgmentally. Um, those are some of the things that we've learned and some of the ways that we've um, developed programs to identify um, and kind of mitigate some of these factors that that might um, contribute to suicide in the workplace. Betsy, I pass it over to you. Thank you. Well, you guys have pretty much covered it, but I will piggyback on what you all said. For me, I feel very fortunate that I um, was blessed with a great church. Um, 
I have been able to, you know, do Bible studies, collect, uh, connect with other women. Um, and that has been very, very helpful. My faith has probably been the number one thing that has um, pulled me through. Secondly, I joined a suicide support group specifically for widows. Um, you just really never know, you know, the feelings associated with and unless you've actually been there as a widow. Um, that has been very, very powerful and very, very helpful. Um, you know, I got to the crossroads where um, it was, you know, are you going to become the best version of yourself, Betsy, or, you know, not. And I have three kids to raise. Um, <clears throat> we all decided to become the best versions of ourselves. Um, my boys are amazing. They transformed their bodies through exercise. Um, I go to yoga a lot. I work out a lot. My daughter's on the track team. So I think just moving is really important. And you don't have to join the track team, but you know, going out for a walk even sometimes is just so helpful. Um, my motto every day, you know, was to thank God for everything he has given me, gratitude. I've had a lot of blessings come out of this tragedy. Um, I just some days wake up and thank God for the breath in my lungs. And we start again, one foot in front of the other. Um, everything that you guys have said is very, very helpful and very, very true. And I can't thank you enough on behalf of all the suicide survivors out there um, for your wisdom. And um, we just keep moving forward. And I think talking about it um, and trying to eradicate the stigma it's very, very important. So thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for rounding that out. I, I, I feel like I could have been writing, you know, for the whole time everyone was speaking such helpful and practical, yet very thoughtful and intentional ways um, to kind of run the spectrum from individual to organizational ways to, uh, to support, to bring awareness, to bring um, intentionality behind the things that we choose to do when we're supporting someone who's experienced a loss. So um, I, I'm hoping that everyone took great notes on that part too and, and have some things that they're able to think about both for themselves individually, but also you know, in organizations, um, in the places that you work, we're, we're connected to our colleagues, we're connected you know, in, in various ways in the different circles that we're in. And so knowing that this applies to all of those uh, is is really a powerful thing to to hear. So thank you uh, for the the closing thoughts around best practices and and what those takeaways can be. Um, I do want to just share we have had some questions come through. Um, and while we don't have a whole lot of time to answer them, we are going to gather those questions. Um, and see what we can do to provide information as a follow-up um, to, to the, the time that we've all spent together um, today. So um, I just wanna share that, that as we think about um, the strides that have been made, I think in suicide awareness, um, prevention and postvention, education, all of those things, um, it's my hope that we continue to move away from treating suicide as a taboo subject. And we've touched on that quite a bit here today. Uh, the importance of shining a light, the importance of having conversations that we're maybe tentative to have um, is so vital in making more strides in this area. Um, George, you had mentioned the kind of dichotomy of physical health and mental health, and it, it makes me think about how even really not too long ago, we referred to cancer as the C word, right? It was a, a fearful thing to talk about. People were terrified to bring it up or even to mention it, but through education, awareness, talking about it, being open you know, about uh, the impacts of cancer, now look at the funding, the research and the avenues of support that really have grown exponentially. So um, it's my hope that webinars like today um, are a vital step in the direction of removing that taboo, um, increasing awareness and willingness to talk openly about suicide and to help those that need it most. So my deepest thanks to you as panelists uh, today um, and to all of you for joining us and participating with us in this conversation. Um, 
you'll see on your screen shortly uh, a QR code that will take you to a resource page through Vital Work Life um, for suicide and healthcare um, resources, as well as other um, things that, that can help as you start to think through how we move the needle on these conversations. Um, we also request your feedback and comments in the pop-up survey um, that you'll receive shortly. Uh, and again, we just thank you so much for being with us today.